In this lesson, we'll talk about equilibrium and elasticity. Equilibrium can be thought of as translational equilibrium and rotational equilibrium. Where in translational equilibrium, all we basically say is the sum of the linear forces must be equal to zero. And hence, the linear acceleration will be equal to zero because there's no net force. When we talk about the rotational equilibrium, there we consider in the torques, and we say the sum of the torques must be equal to zero, meaning the torques that are turning the object anti-clockwise must be equal to those turning it clockwise. We can also note that uh, for both translational and rotational equilibrium, the momentum uh, will be constant uh, because the velocities are not changing. Let's take some few examples. If you look at this beam, and we consider it to be in translational and rotational equilibrium, can we be able to find F1 and F2? To do this, we have to put a reference point at one of the unknowns and say the sum of the torques will be equal to zero. Therefore, 20 times the distance to the reference position, which is 8D minus 10 times 4D minus F1 times 2D minus 30 times D. And this must be equal to zero. We can then solve as follows. And we find F1 to be equal to 45 newtons. We can then take the sum of the forces to be equal to zero, applying the translational equilibrium. The forces that are going up are positive. Those that are going down are negative. Add them together like that, making F2 the subject of the formula and substituting 45 for F1. We will then find F2 to be equal to 65 newtons. In the next example, we've got a block of mass 2.7 kilograms that's placed on a beam having a mass of 1.8 kilograms. And we've got to calculate the forces at each of the two stands, which are the extreme ends. Because we've got two unknowns, we choose a reference point at one of the scales. Let's take the left scale. And by applying the rules of rotational equilibrium, which says the sum of the torques must be equal to zero, and substituting the lengths and forces that we have, we get FR to be 15.45 newtons. Now we've got one of the unknowns. We can then apply the condition for translational equilibrium and substitute FR to get FL to be 28.69 newtons. Let's take the last example. Here we are given a mass of 430 kilograms, that's hanging on a slanting beam of mass 85 kilograms and we are given the vertical distance A to be 1.9 meters and the horizontal distance B to be 2.5 meters. Let's find the tension in the cable. To do this, because we've got two unknowns, we choose a rotation of, at one of the unknowns. Let's take the hinge. The sum of the torques must equal to zero. And the clockwise torques are positive, while the anti-clockwise ones are negative. By substituting the forces and the perpendicular distances as given, we get the tension TC to be 6,000 and 98.98 newtons. We can now find the force on the hinge uh, using the condition of uh, translational equilibrium. We can find FV, which is that force over there, the vertical force. Uh, the vertical force will be equal to the sum of the two weights. The first weight, 430 times 9.81.
plus the second weight, which is 85 times 9.81. That is 5052.15 Newton. Similarly, we can find the horizontal force at the hinge, which is just equal to the tension in the cable TC, 6098.98. And we can then find the force using the Pythagoras theorem, squaring the vertical and the horizontal uh, components putting that under the square root, and then we get 7919.71 Newton. And finally, we can find angle theta using the inverse 10 of the vertical component over the horizontal component, and that will give us a, an answer of 39.63 degrees. Let's now talk about elasticity. And in this section, you need to remember three things. First, stress, which is equal to the force over the area that's been applied on. Strain, which is the change in the dimension over the original dimension. That could be the length, the area, or the volume. And then the modulus, which is the stress over the strain. Now you have different moduli depending on what is changing, whether it's the length, the area, or the volume. Also, you need to know that the force can cause tension in the material, or it can compress the material, or it can cause what we refer to as torsion or shear in the material. Now, when a tension force is applied to a material, it will elongate the material by dl or dA or dV. When it is a compressive force, it will shorten the length by dL, dA or dV. And when it is a shear force, it will twist the material because it is not applied on the same line of action. A 2 meter long rod with a diameter of 20 centimeters is stretched to 4.55 micrometers using a force of 5,000 newtons. Let's identify this material. And to do this, we need to remember our equations of elasticity. The Young's modulus can be rewritten as follows, FL over ADL, and remembering that the area of a circular shape is pi r squared and converting everything to SI units, we can then identify the material to be aluminium, which has the Young's modulus of 70 times 10 to the power 9 newtons per square meter. For most elastic materials, stress is directly proportional to strain, and that's where you get the elastic moduli from. Um, and you get the maximum point um, called the yield strength, which after that point, the object is no longer elastic. We refer to it as being plastic. Plasticity simply means when you remove the force, the object does not go back to its original dimension. Now, the rupture occurs at a, the maximum stress that an object can sustain.